Hi, good afternoon, Professor Mapabani. Thank you for agreeing to, to, to speak with us. Um, just a few questions uh, regarding your involvement in this year's World City Summit. Uh, first question to you. Um, Singapore regularly punches above its weight in the global arena. Can you comment on Singapore's role as host of the World City Summit, which is now in its third edition? How significant do you think this homegrown event in terms of exercising international leadership and extending our country's soft power? Well, I think many people around the world are beginning to be aware that in facing the challenges of urbanization, uh, there are very few role model cities in the world. And Singapore is increasingly developing the reputation of possibly having the best planned city in the whole world. And that's partly because we are the world's only city-state. And since we are the world's only city-state, we can control all the factors in a way that other cities cannot control. I mean, Mayor Bloomberg wants to introduce congestion road pricing. He's overruled by the uh, state uh, capital in Albany. We have the freedom uh, to do so. And because we have the freedom to do so, we have succeeded in creating a remarkable urban environment that is the envy of cities around the world. And that's why more and more mayors are coming to the World City Summit. Now, Singapore aspires to be a provider of urban solutions. And, and many of the solutions are really creative and innovative responses to our own unique circumstances. Uh, circumstances. And I'm talking in terms of like the ERP, congestion charging, public housing, or even the, the way that we, we are, we are approaching uh, the, the shortage of water. Uh, and this is creative in terms of both the technical and the public policy perspectives. How relevant do you think uh, Singapore's experience and expertise is for other countries, particularly countries in the emerging world? I think, you know, when Singapore started off in 1965 as a newly independent country, we had the same per capita income as Ghana. We had slums. We had race riots. Uh, we had a weak infrastructure. We had pirate taxis. We had all the problems of third world cities. So it's quite remarkable. There are very few cities around the world that have gone in one lifetime from third world standards to first world standards. So if you are a mayor of a city that has third world standards, whether it's in Asia, Africa, or Latin America, and you look around the world and you say, where can I go le learn lessons from in urban development? Uh, more, often than not, more often than not, the answer is Singapore. So I think clearly uh, you will see more and more uh, cities coming to Singapore to learn because Singapore's success record is remarkable. Yeah. You, you've written about the new Asian hemisphere. Um, can I ask you to speculate on, on the cities in new Asian cities um, that are in this Asian hemisphere that you wrote about? How different will they be from the Western cities? Well, I think the physical infrastructure of Asian cities will be similar to the physical infrastructure of Western cities, whether it's highways, airports, bridges, tunnels, same. But the cultural infrastructure of Asian cities will be different from Western cities because Asian culture is different. And I think the one big competitive advantage that Asian cities have over Western cities is that the Asians are more welcoming. If you go to Thailand, the Thai people are incredibly warm and generous when they meet you. So if you want to receive a very warm uh, reception and a very different cultural experience, you'll find more and more people traveling to, traveling to Asian cities rather than Western cities. And therefore, the, what do you call that? There'll be a major Asian cultural renaissance coming, and to see the major Asian cultural renaissance, you have to go to Asian cities. Great. Thank you very much.